Hi, and welcome to this video where we're going to explore using Excel to model data with trend lines. So this is a very simple approach for regular data, and you may find this useful for your Leaving Cert Applied Maths modeling project. So a quick introduction to the idea of data analysis. So what we're looking at here is trying to identify trends and patterns. Um, in Excel, we have a trend lines tool, which is going to help visualize that relationship. So I'm going to use some data that I have from the Yellow, Yellowstone wolf population, and I'm going to prepare it using Excel, showing you step by step how I did that. So your first step is to get your data into Excel. Here's my data on the right. It's really important that you clean this data. So the way that we're working, that year won't be read as a year. It's just going to be read as a data point. So it's really important that if you have any missing years that you fill those in, you try to find data for every year if that's how you're jumping. Um, if you do have jumps in your data, maybe you are doing a population that is recorded every five years, make sure all the jumps are the same. Once you are happy with that, we're going to create a scatter plot. So you're going to select your data. So just highlight that within your cells and then you insert chart and we want to scatter plot with straight lines. And when you do that, it should look something like this. So here is my data. So my data runs from 1995 until 2023. So in 1995, they decided to reintroduce wolves into the Yellowstone um, into the Yellowstone Park. And this is the, rec the record of the population over time. Now, this is quite irregular and I suppose before I talk about the data itself, let's just go straight into adding the trend lines and understanding how we can do that in Excel. So to add a trend line on my graph, I use the plus and I go down to trend lines. I select the little arrow to the right and more options. This will allow me to select um, any of the different types of trend lines that we have. Now be careful in maths when we say a line, we obviously mean a straight line. Here for our trend lines, we do have curves as well. So once you've chosen your trend line type, one thing that's really, really helpful to do is to display both the equation and the or squared value on the chart. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the or squared value as we go through. So some of the trend line options that we have, they're there on the right. We have exponential, linear, logarithmic, polynomial, and be aware that that polynomial can be given in different orders. That order is what we might call the degree in math, so the highest power. So polynomial of order two is quadratic, polynomial of order three will be cubic and so on. And we have a power, so that will be a base that isn't E. Um, and we're not gonna use that move Moving average okay it's there but that is not one that we're going to work with so just I suppose thinking about what might best suit your data polynomials can be really really good for irregular data do you play around with that degree logarithmic and exponentials think about growth and decay which we often see in our populations and experiment with different trend lines to improve your or squared. So our or squared value is going to allow us to see how close our trend line is to our data. That or squared value will be between zero and one. Zero is a poor match. One is a very, very strong match. So I'm going to show you using my data how I went through each of these trend line options and explored them. And we'll look at that or squared value. So here is my data with an exponential, and you can see it's e to a power. My or squared is very, very small. So again, remember it's between zero and one. Effectively, that's near zero, meaning an exponential would be a very poor way to represent my data. The linear here, um, you can see my line, it's a negative slope going down here. And again, my or squared is very, very low. That's not great. My logarithmic, it's actually worse. So definitely not one that I'm going to choose. It's got LN, so log to base E. Uh, polynomial of order two, okay, my or squared's a little bit better. It's still not great. This you can see is a negative quadratic given by Y equals minus something X squared plus an X plus a constant. All of that calculation is done for you in Excel. 
and then I tried polynomial of order three and this is as close as I was able to get my data. So my R squared is 0 0.6. It's not brilliant, okay? It's the best I can find for my data. <clears throat> but it's definitely not a very good match. Um, it is possible with different populations, you're going to get a much stronger match than that. So I have a positive cubic here, and we're looking at saying, okay, this is great, very exciting. I now effectively have what is like a model for maybe the first iteration of my project. So some things to be aware of. The equation, the trend line, what that does is it compares the relationship between our variables. So for us, that's the year to population. And um, the way that that works, our X value is going to be time and our time will start whenever your population starts. So keep that in mind. Um, how this will work, the first year you have will be T equals one and so on. So if you need to go backwards, really focus Focus on um, how many years since the start of your data set to plug in for that value of X. Our R squared value indicates how well the trend line fits the data. So R squared suggests other factors influence the data so that there's something else going on or that it's not easy to predict. So if you have R squared that's very, very close or like even for mine, I have a 0 0.6, which isn't great, but it's much better. I'm not going to jump straight in and go, yes, this is a really good model for my data. I also have to look about, OK, not just how it fits the data I have, but how will it predict the future? The future. So you may have a very high R square value, but what is going to happen here in the future? So remember that that R square value tells us how closely mapped the data you currently have is to this function or this model. And um, but what we're going to use is the forecast tool to see well how will it act in the near and um, future, but also maybe the long term future. So here um, I've selected show me the next 10 time periods. So for me and my data, that's here. And how I do that is using this forecast. And I'm going to go forward 10, which effectively gives me 10 of my time periods. So again, remember, I'm using my um, positive cubic as the closest model I have. This is what it looks like for the next 10 years. Now, this is very, very unrealistic. So even though my polynomial of order three gave me the highest or square value, so for me, it was the closest map to my data, the prediction over the next 10 years is making it clear that this is not going to be a good model if I want to predict population in the future. And that is just as important as how it mimics the data now. So I need to come up with a better way to do this. Now, if this is your first iteration, um, I suppose you can see and work with it a little bit and talk about these issues if you want. Um, I suppose the big, big issue here, and it's one we see when we do exponentials, any polynomials, um, the future population is going to be unbounded, which basically means that right arm of our cubic, because it's positive, is going to go on forever and to infinity. So that's obviously unrealistic for any population. It is always going to be limited by its resources. So we need to keep that in mind. So what are, I suppose, some ways around this? So I'll talk through a few, but just um, before I do that, let's talk about, you know, a first iteration basic model. Maybe use your data up to 2020 and then use it to predict the latest data you have. That might be 2024, it might be 2023. And maybe use all of your data to predict the latest data you have. So for mine, even though I was using that data to create a model, my model wasn't exact for my 2020 uh, for 2023 data. Uh, you can use your model to predict short and long term population figures. And um, maybe there are other predictions to compare it to some populations, especially maybe human populations. There is already predictions there in place. You can compare that to if not, you could make a judgment. So the judgment on mine would be, well, this is not in any way sensible because it has gone way above what that population has ever been. So you can make some realistic judgments there. So another thing to think about is, is there a justification for ignoring large increase or decrease in the population? So is there something there that maybe isn't natural? 
So, for example, in mine, there is a reintroduction of wolves. So there is a huge growth phase that we wouldn't necessarily see in nature. It's only there because of the situation. So is it possible for me to maybe ignore that section and look without it, which would then change the model that I would use? Again, a lot of your work in this project is about justifying what you're doing, looking at the assumptions, looking at, you know, why am I doing what I'm doing? So this is a good one to think about. Is there something that's out of the ordinary? If it's something that's out of the ordinary, can it be used to then predict the ordinary future? But then the other argument might say, but well, you may have other non-normal events in the future. Using the past to predict the future is always tricky, but it's all these things you want to think about for your project. So another option is to break your data into sensible sections. And I'm going to show you a lovely Leaving Star Higher Level question, not apply maths, actual maths question, and um, that I think explains this really really well and again just remember all populations will be limited by resources so it's not possible for growth to continue forever and um, continue increasing forever you will not have a population that is infinite you cannot so you'll be limited by resources depending on your model there will be different resources so it could be food it could be um physical size of location and um, it could be air it could be anything depending on your population so here's a lovely question that is worth taking a look at it is leaving certain maths question it is from the 2024 scc sample it's paper one um, and it is question 9b so um what i like about this is the fact it presents us with a model that cannot really be just one function so it's made up of a combination of functions so here we have the velocity and it's broken into three sections. So it's zero when t is between zero and 0 0.2. It's a negative quadratic between t is 0 0.2 and t is five. And then it's just 11.52 for t is greater than or equal to five. So this is what our graph looks like. And basically what it's saying is, for the first 0 0.2 seconds, there's no movement. So this is like the reaction to the starter gun, okay? So it's that little bit of a delay and this reaction. The next section we have is kind of nearly like the first part of a negative quadratic. So this is the acceleration section, but the acceleration is decreasing over time until it flattens out, which gives us a constant speed. So the speed is leveling out to a constant top speed. So this is a great example of where if you were doing just a negative quadratic, um, effectively the speed would drop back down to zero, which is not how you would end a race. However, it's nice to see how you can maybe use sections of a function to describe movement. And in this case, the movement of, well, the speed of a runner. So this is something you can think about maybe breaking your data into sensible sections when you're working. For further iterations, there are two kind of really nice questions that um, I would say to look at. Look at the first one is the 